All right, today I want to talk about some of the forgotten units of Warhammer 3. Those troop choices that perhaps had an illustrious reputation to uphold in their translation from the source material that have kind of fallen by the wayside in Immortal Empires, either due to power creep or poor implementation or a general lack of attention since the combined campaign launched. There are dozens of good examples in this game. We're not going to be able to cover them all here, but I'm going to highlight five specific units that could really use some help right now and explain why I think they need help. So with any luck and some useful discussion in the comment section below, we can propose some buffs to bring these bad boys back up to speed. Before we jump in, I wanna preface this video by saying that number one, balancing a game this gigantic is really hard. There are a lot of moving pieces and unintended consequences that can arise anytime even seemingly minor changes are implemented. We've seen that a lot recently. Number two, one of the major changes in the jump from Mortal Empires to Immortal Empires was that Ultra Unit Size became the default setting. What didn't change was the weapon strength for many of the most powerful creatures to account for that shift, which means units like Carnosaurs, Hellpit Abominations, Terror Geists, Dinos, and Shagus effectively got a blanket DPS nerf, one that I would argue should probably be reverted. So as we go through this list, keep in the back of your mind that if we're talking single entities, there's a good chance that our weapon strength value should be about 15 to 20% higher than it is currently because every unit in the game got an HP increase roughly equivalent to that when we jump from game two to game three. There's also the fact that for some of these units, their core identity is in direct opposition to what makes a Total War unit good. Where possible, I like it when CA can buff underperforming and underutilized units, especially when they're iconic and easily recognizable like the face of a particular faction but I realized that in some cases, it's not really possible to change the unit enough to make it great without messing with those inherent traits. And in those situations, I'd probably prefer it maintain its source material identity, even if it's bad in total war. So the first unit I wanna to discuss today is actually a cast of units, some of the premier avatars of the entire setting. Greater demons in general are actually quite disappointing right now. And funnily enough, the Greater Demon ranking video I made when the game first came out still applies today. I'd probably rank them in the exact same order a year and a half later. Of the four, I think Lords of Change and Bloodthirsters are currently in better shape, although they certainly have problems of their own. But Generic Keeper of Secrets are kind of garbage, and so are Great Unclean Ones, which will be the focus at number five. Now, I played a few Kugath campaigns since the Champions of Chaos DLC came out, and some of the issues people have with Nurgle right now feel a bit overblown to me. They certainly have their fair share of issues as a faction, ones that will likely be addressed in Thrones of Decay come the end of the year. But one thing is for certain right now, for Runa's power that should be all about overwhelming surges, Nurgle does a lot of waning and only a little bit of waxing in terms of their power spikes. It takes forever and a day to get great unclean ones in the first place and to make them even halfway decent, you have to spend a bunch more time researching technologies to tuck them up with the lore of Nurgle, which to be fair, is one of the best lores of magic in the entire game. Surely though, after all that time and money invested, you would be getting a world beater at the other end, fit to strike fear into any foe, right? It's what great and clean ones are all about. Well, not really. When you compare them to even just a default giant, already a somewhat subpar unit that costs 400 less gold than them, you start to see some issues immediately. The Chaos Giant, for example, has 200 more weapon strength, 1200 more HP, way better leadership, does not suffer from demonic instability, a trait much more devastating for demons than crumbling is for undead, and it has 15% missile resist to top it all off. What you'd expect from a monster like this is great tanking potential, healing, and wave clear. But while Stream of Corruption, Blight Boil and Fleshy Abundance are all fantastic spells. You don't get them all without big time investment and we already know how effective blubber butts like this are at absorbing range fire. They aren't. AI behavior in campaign fixates on sniping the highest value units possible no matter what, to a much greater degree in game three than they even did in game two, often to their own detriment. It's very easy to game and abuse it if you play around it, but it's also immersion breaking and obnoxious and in the case of a slow lumbering behemoth like a great unclean one, it is not uncommon to see only a handful of low tier archer units make a massive dent in their HP, which is to say nothing of a faction like the high elves or chaos dwarfs who may feel 10, 12 archer 
blunderbuss or artillery pieces simultaneously. To enter that fire arc essentially means instant death if they have enough ranged DPS, which means fast movers to tie up the back line is the play, which means battles are usually too fast for a unit like this to make a noticeable impact outside maybe casting a few bound spells. You basically have to hold them back until all those ranged units are tied up, and at that point with Nurgle you've probably already won. Melting to a couple goblin arch units feels absolutely terrible for the face of Nurgle, and in the, and in the case of a great unclean one, there isn't anything the unit itself can do about it. You just have to sit there and take it, or not enter their fire arc at all. With that said, overall, I think the implementation of Greater Demons of Nurgle is mostly fine. There are certain elements of this unit that are just an inherent component of it that I think we're going to have to live with. It's in this unit's nature to be relatively slow and plotting. The most common suggestion that would be thematic and logical in terms of their improvement is a Cloud of Flies missile resist component, perhaps in an area of effect that they could confer to nearby allies. The idea being these creatures are so abhorrent they can summon a storm of black flies to obscure vision and block incoming range attacks. 15 to 20% missile resist is nowhere near enough to invalidate range fire completely, which tends to stupidly overperform for single entity monsters in general, but if you combine it with that default 20% increase in weapon strength and let it passively make the demons around it tankier against missile fire as well, I think you'd have a lot more reason to bring them in campaign and multiplayer. And let's face it, if you're playing a demonic faction, it feels wrong to have the face of your franchise be a no-show. Greater demons should be good. Greater demons should be scary. And at the moment, the generic versions are pretty much anything but. Moving on to number four, we have the steamiest, the dreamiest, the memeiest invention of one Leonardo de Miragliano, the steam tank. On paper, this unit is everything you could ever want for the Empire, right? A mobile weapons platform with 160 armor, long range capabilities, the ability to run over anything and everything in CQB. I mean, it's a tank. That shit's unfair, especially when you're fighting screaming cavemen whose biggest technological advancement in the last two millennia are sticks and stones and the discovery of fire. But the steam tank, for all its bluster and mean appearance, has some clear-cut issues that could use resolution. The biggest problem it used to deal with was that it would become exhausted. Frankly, not as silly as you might think, its components breaking down and steam running low are reasonable explanations for it becoming slower and weaker as a battle drags on, but that has since been fixed with perfect vigor, which means it no longer suffers from armor debuffs after driving around for a bit. Awesome. The core problem at the moment is that for 2100 gold, you just expect more out of a unit's performance. If you're going to pay that kind of premium, it has to really dominate in certain areas, and in its current form, it doesn't really do anything exceptionally well. If it misses a shot, which it does often, you lose out on all damage from that volley because it only has one gun, unlike most artillery pieces that have four weapons firing. In counter battery, it's pretty underwhelming, lacking the DPS to eliminate single arty pieces like the magma cannon, or the accuracy to go down the line taking out four dwarf cannons in a row, for example. But of course, it's not all about the shooting, it's designed to blend melee and ranged combat together. On the melee side, like many chariots in game three, it's nothing to write home about either. Throw it even into some basic gore herd and it will take a long time to clear them away, taking noticeable damage in return. What do its passive steam guns do then? Not a whole lot, but look cool. And when we compare its damage output in melee to a unit like the Skullcracker, which is approaching half the cost, the power creep becomes quite apparent there. I'd argue the steam tank should not be quite as strong as the Skullcracker in melee, owing to the fact that it doesn't have spinning blades of doom and destruction mounted on the prow, but there's certainly room for improvement in terms of its infantry clearing potential. There are really two features I'd like to see moving forward. The first is a steam explosion, which sends enemies flying away from the tank and deals impactful damage to those infantry closest to the blast. Wouldn't mind if there was even some kind of interesting trade-off there, where the ability is very powerful and can wreck low to mid armor infantry on a high cooldown, but using it would slow you down tremendously for 20 or 30 seconds as steam is generated and it gears up to chug along again. Using it would leave your steam tank slow and vulnerable, but put the whoopin on anything that got too close. It needs burst damage, the ability to quickly eliminate infantry threats 
so I can transition back to shooting. And the other feature is the overdrive mechanic that the Skullcracker already has. More power, more mass, more speed, more charge bonus on a long cooldown accompanied by a big steamy sound effect when it rumbles into the fray. This could be used as an escape mechanism or a way to bulldoze through a point as it leads the charge. With those two elements, I feel like the steam tank would be more thematic, a lot more fun to play with, you'd have some active abilities to throw in there, and it'd be more deserving of its exorbitant price tag. It is not a terrible unit right now by any stretch of the imagination, but I do not believe it is worth its cost either, and that is a shame because I'd say it's one of the coolest units on the Empire roster. At number three, we have a familiar, devastatingly ugly set of faces. Uh-oh, it's the Gorgers, and they need some help. Look, on launch day for Warhammer 3, Gorgers were stupidly OP. There can be no denying it. At 1100 gold, they were trading evenly against or beating their direct hard counters against elites who cost 1200 to 1700, so that means 100 to 600 more than them, not just on the anti-large halberd side, in the case of Celestial Dragon Guard, but also against other large units like War Bear Riders and Minotaurs with big ass axes, both of which are bonus versus large units. A stalking anti-infantry vanguard ambusher had zero business beating those kinds of chad units in a straight up fight while also beating elite halberds from the front. I mean really, beating great weapon minotaurs straight up? That's why Mornfangs and Rhinox great weapons exist. It didn't make any sense, and furthermore, it invalidated a good portion of the rest of the roster. If Gorgers could beat anything and everything, why would I use the specialists who can't? CA agreed, Gorgers got nerfed. The problem, of course, is that they got nerfed hammered, and as is often the case when CA releases a unit that is super duper overperforming, they went overboard the other direction and just gutted it entirely. Scalpel instead of hammer, typically how I like to see balance, not what was done here. Not only did they lose 20 AP, but their entity count was reduced from 16 to 12, resulting in an effective health loss of 2100, which is huge. It was about 25% of their health pool just gone instantly, and four models went poof as well, which meant significantly less damage output, less attacks, and an easier time getting overwhelmed in simple fights that they really shouldn't be struggling with. And that hits an unbreakable unit even harder because you would normally always get access to those attacks, get access to all that HP. Another unit with morale would route off and you wouldn't be fighting. Gorgers are fighting to the last man. So the fact that they lost all that HP really hurt their performance to the point where I think it was probably overboard. On top of that, Scrag's already kind of a bad Lord. I mean, he's better than Greasis, but that's not saying a whole lot. And to get those cool Gorger buffs, you have to use a subpar battlefield commander which would be fine if they'd suddenly be good, but the reality is they won't be. They are too squishy now and don't hit hard enough to make up the difference. Now, conceptually, I love Gorgers. They perform a unique and interesting niche on the Ogre roster. The roster is better when they are performing decently, but after getting Lucille to the head, nerf batted into the dirt, they don't really see play in campaign or multiplayer. So what I'd like for them is to find a sweet spot between where they were which was dumb as hell and stupid OP, and where they are now, which is kind of borderline pointless. At 1100 gold, and with all their extra utility from Vanguard and Stalk and Unbreakable, they cannot and should not be world beaters. If it has anti-large and Gorgers are engaging them straight up, they should not be trading effectively. They have no armor, they have low defense. They are armorless, defenseless, frenzied freaks who should be all about aggression and damage output. Give them a bit more HP, give Scrag more ways to buff their combat output on his skill tree, and maybe upkeep reductions as well, find a middle ground for them, and I think they'll be all right. Coming in at number two, we have one of the coolest units in the entire trilogy and one of my personal favorites. The Majesty, the Craftsmanship, the Terror, as Tall Gee strides to war, is matched only by its utter ineptitude in combat. The Hyro Titan is straight up ass cheeks. There is no nicer way to put it. At 2000 gold, it seems to have fairly powerful stats on paper and extra utility from Spirit Leech, Shem's Burning Gaze, and the recharge rate from Spirit Conduit, which should make it a fairly attractive choice as a defensive anchor on a roster that's known for its squishiness. 
The reality though, is that the Hydro Titan suffers from every possible issue a single entity could. Where most SEMs like the Hell Pit A-Bomb and the Giants have insanely good leadership and morale, this construct has 60 and crumbles. Where good SEMs have mobility and can pick and choose at least some of their fights, the Hydro Titan moves at 32 speed, meaning it can't even catch infantry. It's designed as a monster duelist and tank, but it's way slower even than Giants and it can't tank well because of its low LD, huge hitbox, and susceptibility to range fire, which is to say nothing of its severely problematic fondness for wading into melee and then just standing around. Seriously, this unit spends 70% of its time shuffling in place, not doing anything. Not attacking, not killing, just watching the battle unfold as troops swarm around its feet. It's bad at infantry wave clear, taking forever to kill anything, due to low splash attacks and big time overkill on the models it does hit, and while it does perform well in monstrous duels, when it actually attacks, it's never going to be able to fight the units it wants to because it simply cannot catch them. So it's relegated to spamming Spirit Leech and Magic Missiles at Banshees or the Green Knight. The Hyro Titan simply suffers from an identity crisis on the Tomb King's roster. If I want to kill infantry, I'm going to use a Cymrian War Sphinx, which has the mobility and charge damage to brutalize foot troops without being a beacon for missile fire. If I want to kill cav or monsters, or to battle the mighty Kolek, I'm going to use a Necro Sphinx, neither of which are particularly good units right now anyway. And it's all the more disappointing because the unit looks so freaking cool and it takes so long to field even a handful of them. And you can see in the test right here, the difference in combat performance between a Hyro Titan and a Cameron War Sphinx when faced with a bunch of massed infantry is a bit comical. With the Cameron War Sphinx, I can dive into the back line, shut down archers easily, kill lots of infantry every time I charge in. With the Hyro Titan, you basically just waddle in and then start getting shot and there's nothing you can do about it at that point. You're committed. When Katep started with a Hyro Titan in his campaign, that was a legit reason to play him, simply for the novelty and cool factor. And of course, it could still carry you in the early game, as long as you're not letting it get shot by missiles, but those days are gone now. Tier 5 units don't really exist in starting armies anymore. By the time you unlock a Hyro Titan, you don't really need a Hyro Titan, even though you'll probably still recruit a few of them because of Tomb King's unit caps. What this unit really needs is significantly higher damage output versus infantry, which are the only units it can reliably get a hold of. No more overkilling three models per swing against clan rats, it should have a very consistent output versus elite infantry and chaff. It should have innate missile resist of 15% on top of that 100 armor, because there's absolutely no way to argue that a giant should be able to absorb arrow fire in a similar capacity to crafted marble, and it needs way better LD. I have no idea why an immovable, fearless construct only has 60 morale when wild animals are essentially running around with 90 plus. Fix the constant shuffling without attacking if possible, although I bet that's not a very easy thing for CA to do. Give it that 20% increased weapon strength that many SEMs deserve right now, and it probably still won't be great because you still can't pick and choose any fights for it, but it'll be in much better shape than it is now. And finally, at number one, we have Doom Flayers for the Skaven. When was the last time any of you even saw this unit, much less recruited it? What does this unit even do? I'll tell you one thing, they don't kill armored infantry, even though that's its intended role. And it's not that they're entirely incapable, it's just that you're literally going to die of boredom and old age watching them attempt it. I did a bunch of tests against low-level armored foot troops like Dwarf Warriors, Miners, Jade Warriors for Cathay, and the results were a bit embarrassing. I microed out the ass, cycle charging over and over and over again multiple times, babysitting them the entire time with nothing else to focus on, which in a real battle is not how things work, and by the five to eight minute mark, they were usually between 300 to 450 damage value with only a handful of models actually killed, like 25 to 40, against low tier armored chaff. This unit costs a thousand plus, but it doesn't kill anything. It's suffering from the exact same problems that many chariots have suffered from since the start of Warhammer 3, and that its killing power versus foot troops just does not justify the hefty price tag. A cardinal sin for a unit that should be so much fun to play with and watch. I mean, it's a motorcycle biker gang with mad scientists cackling ratmen riding atop a whirling fury of spinning blades of death and destruction. There was a short time 
around the Prophet and the Warlock, where they were really good, where they were messing up cavalry and armored foot troops and everything in between. But those glory days have long since passed them by, and I don't even remember last time they received any kind of love in patches. Sure, in campaign with the Forbidden Workshop and Ickit's careful guidance, they can get pretty decent, but the base unit is a big, steaming pile of poop, and I don't really know what to do with it. Certainly an increase in weapon strength would be a welcome adjustment, but I feel like there's more wrong with Doom Flayers under the code right now, and chariots in general, really, and I can't quite put my finger on it. But yeah, those are my top five forgotten units in desperate need of buffs. I'm sure you all can come up with some other worthy additions to add to the list, but hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you all in the next video. Andy Pride, signing off for now. Have a good one, guys.